All right, so that's sort of the, the shared reading, ex, you know, a sequence in a nutshell. Um, the other big group activities that we did in a 10-day sequence was shared writing. Um, so in shared reading, of course, uh, you know, the focus was, you know, you've got some emergent readers using predictable text. Here we've got emergent writers, and we are going to be using these predictable charts. And I'm not by any means saying that this is the best way to do um, shared writing with this group, but for us it met a lot of the criteria that we had set out um, to do. So the shared writing approach that we looked at was is built on the structured language experience approach um, um, by Pat Cunningham um, and others. Um, uh, essentially, it uses a very predictable structure to get kids engaged in uh, working with print in a group experience. It doesn't have to be group, actually, um, but most times it is. Um, and so you use a chart um, to write as you are talking in some cases. In some cases, you have some of it pre-prepared, depending on how much management you have to do of your group. Some teachers, you know, can't turn their backs <laughs> to write when the group is there, um, even though they might have the support of aides. Um, but in, in a perfect world, you are writing as you are talking. Um, and then it's developed with a predictable structure, and then the kids essentially fill in the blank. For kids who use AAC um, at this level, uh, it's a lot of choice making, right? They are not going to have the generative ability to come up with an answer for that fit with these things. Um, so essentially they are being provided with choices um, in a very, for a very beginning communicator, that may be a specific choice board developed for this, right? For a more advanced communicator who's using, you know, has a, an AAC system that they can manage and has a more, uh, a richer vocabulary set, um, then they can use that to dictate a response. But in all cases, they are dictating and we are scribing. So they are not physically writing or keyboarding or anything like that. They are contributing. But what they're gaining from that is seeing their contribution go to print, right? They are seeing themselves as a writer, and they are learning a whole bunch of different things um, uh, about you know, print through that experience. So generally, the therapist or the teacher uh, chooses the topic um, we had some that were more book related. We had some that were more related to the core words themselves. So, for example, um, you know, if it was a you know a book that the kids were all very engaged about, the teacher may choose to to have the the um, predictable chart around that. Um, if they needed more practice with the core words, she would maybe make it more focused on that. And, you know, the, the kids learn that, you know, they can do their part in, in dictating the sentences. A lot of times we use shared classroom communication devices to then read back those sentences um, so that they could hear what they said spoken aloud. Um, and they're just getting a lot of information about letters, um, words, conventions of print, and things like that. So as I said, they are uh, dictating their responses using a whole bunch of different things. Um, it could be um, a choice board that was made particularly for that, um, but we were trying more and more to get them to their personal speech generating devices. That you know, is a long process, and I'm not just talking about the funding piece. To be able to figure out what a kid needs, something that's going to be able to suit them for a year or two years, or in our case, for insurance purposes, five years, it's really tough when they're three and four years old and coming in without much of a language base. So that process can take a long time, and... Um, um, we have to kind of fill in the gaps with other things until we get good answers to that. So for the most part during this preschool time, very few of these kids will have their own individual speech generating device um, for one reason or another. Um, a lucky few, we will have figured it out well enough and gotten that process completed, but they are in the minority. Um, and a lot of times we are using uh, more of the low-tech um, digitized speech devices as shared classroom communication aids mm -hmm. where we are changing the vocabulary to fit uh, the different books that we are doing or the different um, you know, predictable charts that they're engaging in. 
um, just so that we are moving them forward with voice output and not waiting and waiting and waiting. So here's one example um, just of a, um, uh, a court of a predictable chart here where um, they were kind of naming the um, uh, fish and they were, I think the teacher in this day was really kind of focusing on um, some of the things had to do with the special letter that went along with that book. So they had freedom to do with it what they want, want, wanted to, but as they were going through the process for it, she was um, modeling the core vocabulary and eliciting it even if their particular response didn't have a core word. Right, so they were using the core vocabulary through the process of, of the activity, whether or not that's what got dictated here. So these are just some, um, you know, different ways in which kids were engaged. We have every once in a while some hyperlexic kids, right, and so they can actually spell out responses from time to time. Um, now, comprehension is a different issue, but here when we're talking about the production, um, some of them have memorized how things are spelled, and so we tried to take advantage of that and give them access to a keyboard so that they could spell out their responses um, if they knew them. So again, like the shared writing, the shared um, um, like the shared reading, these shared writing lessons uh, focus on a lot of different things and the kids gain a lot of skills that will help them as they grow. Um, listening in a group activity is huge for, for these kids at this age. Uh, it, the aided language input helps a lot with that because it gives them a point of focus. Um, whereas they're not processing a lot of what they're hearing, they get bored and they can distract themselves very well, but with the, with the aided language input, it helps them focus um, a bit more. But of course, you know, as with the, the, the um, shared reading, we were really in this to get that practice um, with the core vocabulary. Um, and uh, for, mo for most of these kids, that worked really well. For the kids that come in with a lot of significant motor impairments, um, you know, this was a lot more of a challenge for them. Um, but for, for most of the kids, it worked very well. Just different ways that teachers have um, addressed the predictable chart writing. Sometimes, as you know, I showed you at first, it's on uh, chart paper, but some of them um, began to experiment with um, doing it on um, just... Um, strips of paper and what they liked about that is that they could do that right on the surface where the kids are so like if you use a cube chair with a little desk you could do it right there and um, it was very very uh, interesting to see how the kids level of engagement changed with proximity <laughs> so just having it close to them sometimes made um, all the difference and um, you can kind of see through the body language of these little kids um, that they are really, you know, paying attention. And these are kids that, you know, for the most, for all intents and purposes, are nonverbal. And nobody would have thought of taught, taught, being, you know, exposing them to, um, you know, reading and writing. Um, so this is, you know, just, you know, a kind of um, snippet just to show the same level of predictability that we had in the um, shared reading, we duplicated in shared writing. So we had something that happened before, something that happens before um, we do our writing and then some, we do the writing and then something that happens afterwards. And um, again, a lot of the teacher input um, helped make this a more, um, I would say significant learning experience for them. They came up with letter activities, for example, to do at the end, letter sound songs and things like that. Um, and uh, it gave us a really good opportunity to give additional practice with those core, core words. And again, as in before, um, we scripted those out for the teachers. Uh, they need, didn't need this as much as they did with the, with the reading uh, because I think the act of writing, kind of that predictable structure of the writing, uh, gave them more information. But what they did need this for was ensuring that they were modeling enough core vocabulary because otherwise they tend to do it the way they tend to do it. And what we were trying to do is obviously um, somewhat different. So this, you know, is very similar to what you saw before, but just really um, applied to uh, the writing experience. Um, they're reading it back mostly with, you know, the speech generating devices um, and kids sometimes following along with their core language boards.
So sometimes we put those into PowerPoint books that the kids could read and it was a favorite thing for them to do. Um, you know, cut apart the strips so that they could do that. Um, as we did these group activities, I should mention, um, we always had the adults as participants. So the kids weren't the only participants. All the adults in there, unless they were leading the activity, took a turn. And that was really a good model for the kids in many, many ways. Um, and it also prevented something that I hate, which is sort of the puppeteering of children <laughs> that sometimes happens. You know, they were kind of, you know, peers in a way, all participating um, together. Here's a, um, just some examples of, um, you know, some kids using, um, in this case it was Proloquo. This was a number of years ago. There weren't as many app choices as there are now. Touch Chat is another one that we used extensively um, and still do. And, you know, different adaptations so that they could participate in things like the letter sound song and things like that. So that 10-day sequence of shared reading and shared writing um, experiences really focusing on uh, those, that core vocabulary teaching. And then the other part that sort of holds up this triad is infusing it into the different things that happen in normal preschool activities and routines. So in this situation, we kind of mined the different classrooms we saw, looked at what their activities were, checked out all their toys, their routines, and tried to build core language teaching into um, each of those. So rather for this, rather than them having a predictable sequence, what they have is a smorgasbord. They have a menu of all these different things you could do. Do with, you know, as you will, if, as a teacher, if you like cooking activities and you do a lot of those, then you'll do more of them. Um, but we've tried to provide a whole variety so that the teachers could make good selections. right? Um, so we wanted a lot of um, generalization to the things that they normally do um, and to get them communicating using these core words in activities where, they, where it could be more child-directed and child-led because obviously in the group activities it's all adult-oriented and so that's not going to work um, for everything. And you know, the, a lot of what makes meaningful, what makes this meaningful is them doing it when they've chosen the activity and they have a favorite part, a way of doing it. But we wanted to show teachers how you could embed core language teaching throughout that. So anything, you know, as simple as, you know, arrival time when kids are coming in all different times, um, you could be doing, they could be doing, um, you know, core vocabulary practice, but also some of these other things to build um, those literacy skills. A lot of the times they would have a kind of, um, uh, in the entry area, a little, what's the word I'm thinking of, a bulletin board where they would ha display the core vocabulary words and kids would come in and they'd be able to show them, even if they couldn't say them to their mom, they could show them. Um, um, and so that you know, became one way to get a little bit of additional practice. They all have circle time of one form or another. Um, we have used that for them to, to the teacher introduces words often in um, circle time and they do uh, some of that choral responding that I was indicating earlier. Again, it wasn't my first choice um, as a speech language pathologist, but when we looked at how many opportunities they needed to have throughout the school day, trying to fit those into things that are all contextually based just wasn't feasible, even for the superhero teachers that you know many of us see out there. It just it just couldn't it couldn't be done. They just needed too much practice. Um, and so you know they do some of that choral responding. Um, and the kids actually like that. Right, because they can be competent in it very quickly. When you add the, the burden of context, <laughs> it's harder for them. It's harder, and so they can, you know, they can develop some fluency. They can feel successful, and when the kids feel successful, the teachers and the therapists and the aides feel successful. And that's not to be, you know, underrated. For outside time, we had to be a little bit more creative uh, because, you know, there's just wider variability as to what happens when kids go outside. Um, and so we did um, a couple of games. One was Monkey See, Monkey Do. Um, and so they're really just sort of imitation games, but given that a lot of the playground time, the recess time that we looked at wasn't all that productive, we felt okay about giving them the option of other games to do. Um, um, another one that got, was very popular was a scavenger hunt, which we called Froggy Find. So um, in the looking for column, they would put um, all of their core words there 
or sometimes other things that they were looking for that might be related to the book. And those would sort of be distributed on the path to recess. And as they were walking, they would find them and then check them off. And even the act of checking off what you found is a literacy skill that, that's good for these guys. Um, but again, more opportunities to say core words. Just some examples. Um, um, Tara is, you know, eliciting some core words on a scooter. And if you could do it on a scooter, you could probably do it um, anywhere. Because we, you know, had such a wide range of kids, I just wanted to show, you know, some of the things we were doing with, you know, kids who are learning to use eye gaze computer access. Another thing we did that um, worked very well was during snack time, and we called it quick quack questions. Um, the communication that was happening for AAC kids most time in snack was, let's say it together, <laughs> requesting. <laughs> and we really kind of wanted to get beyond that and introduce the concept of talking about things other than getting what you want. Um, you know, it's so important to be a part of a family to be able to do that in our culture. You know, we're such social beings during mealtimes and things like that. And so we wanted to begin, you know, uh, introducing that by having them notice and talk about things other than what they were eating or wanted to eat. Um, and so uh, we had some questions. That there would be one question every snack time that involved core words, of course, in some way that the kids would have to, you know, respond to. And um, they did, you know, some of the classrooms did it with props and with puppets. Some of them did it with chants. Um, uh, some of them did it with displays. And it became a very popular um, thing. Um, so it would be things like, you know, who has fruit in their snack? and I do are both core words so each kid will have to look around and see what they have and see if they have a have fruit in their snack um, who is an animal at home what is in your snack what are you drinking what was a core word right so they were saying different things and it got as the year went on it got more conversational I promise but it has to start somewhere it has to start somewhere um, so it gave us a little opportunity to introduce the idea of you know conversation while you're eating not just getting another goldfish and they did some graphing too which I thought was really kind of nice so you know um, uh, they would, um, you know, maybe make a chart, so cookies and fruit, and then they would kind of graph, you know, who likes to eat what and try to elicit and uh, obviously model those core words as they did. We used um, an app called Pictello, a storytelling app, quite a lot for homeschool communication um, because if the parent has the app, they can get a code and get access to this particular story. And if not, we can print them out as PDFs. And those are great, too, because the kids love reading about themselves over and over again. But it was also a good vehicle. You know, kids would take turns taking them home and for families to see, you know, what was going on. Um, and, the, and that's such a huge thing for kids um, with AAC needs at the preschool level and, and beyond. But, you know... Um, Every parent wants to know what their kid did in school, and very few of these kids have a way to tell them. But if the parent has a context, like something like this, then they can ask the appropriate questions and then engage, and then the kid can contribute, but they just can't pull it out of nowhere. So things that, you know, there's lots of sensory tables, so we would bury things in that had to do with the story or the core words. And again, it just gave the teacher the experience of how to elicit and model core vocabulary no matter what activity you know she was doing in her classroom. We did some things like vocabulary sorts for some of the kids, particularly the older kids, where uh, you might have um, you know, toys, um, or materials from the classroom, or, or pictures, and then you'd have um, them sorted into two bins, you know, together. At, you know, it wasn't a solo activity. Um, but we would look at it and say, is this something you could, if do was the core word, is this something you could do or not do? Right. So if it was a picture of roller skating, then it was a do. If it's a picture of a building, well, you don't do a building. So, you know, just an added way to be able to talk about the different aspects of the word that we were um, uh, addressing. 
We also wanted to give them some sense of games with rules because they have kid, they have siblings, um, they have classmates who do play games with rules. So developmentally, this was another example where we made them reach to further than what you would expect if you were looking at a strict developmental sequence. But we wanted to teach them to act as if they knew how to do that, and they were fine. And you know, they can do it. They may not have gotten there developmentally in the same way, but it made a difference for them to be able to play with peers, um, with family members. And for us, it gave us an opportunity to give more core vocabulary practice where we could specifically look at the representational system and talk about what it was about that particular symbol that means that particular concept. And that's very hard with most core words. Right, because it's so abstract. So we did some things like bingo, um, with some assistive technology. Um, we did some things like, um, I think I have like lotto games. I think I have that later on. Craft activities, the same kinds of things you would do in any classroom, um, but just as an opportunity to highlight those core words. Um, so we have somebody using partner-assisted scanning down there below. Um, which obviously we did, you know, we almost never use with with kids with autism. But there, in the context of classrooms of kids that do need those access strategies, here's one of the examples you were asking about the size of the communication aids. So the alt chat was is pretty portable and really accommodates a good amount of core vocabulary and uh, fringe as well. Uh, some teachers like to do like little mini cooking activities. Again, you know, we scripted stuff out. We provided um, recipes that went along with the book or whatever. And not that they necessarily need to use that, but we just want to give them the skill base, base of once you're thinking of these four to six words, how you can make them happen, make opportunities for modeling and elicitation happen no matter what the activity is. So, um, Pretend play. Most of our kids aren't that great at this. And so, you know, we wanted to put a couple of, like, you know, opportunities for core vocabulary um, into that because it's something that is in all of their classrooms and um, it isn't always as productive with our kids with autism as it could be. And so uh, we wanted to give a little guidance and so we did that through the um, root of core vocabulary. Um, matching is where we kind of did that lotto, you know, not matching for matching sake, but we did like little lotto games and things like that. And again, these are the things that build fluency with uh, the core language retrieval. And I talked about that games with rules. These are just some of the bingo and the lotto boards that we made. Um, a lot of the times in the centers, they have uh, an alphabet area in preschools. And so, you know, they made alphabet books, and we gave them lots of opportunities to use um, alternative pencils, as Karen Erickson would say, to, uh, if nothing else, put their name. We have a kind of firm rule that nobody else should put your name on anything, <laughs> you, even if it's just a, a mark on paper or a stamp or a sticker or something. That should be um, your contribution. But it gave them lots of other experiences um, as well. And it was a nice thing for them to be able to take home, again, for that context of, of communication. Um, lots of typical alphabet activities and games that you'd see in other preschools, but you have to make adaptations when the student is nonverbal. So for example, if they don't have the ability to make the letter sound and they're working on letter sounds in the center, then we have to do that through um, usually a shared classroom communication device. Another activity we did a lot of was collage building. Um, so, you know, cutting out pictures. Teachers do a lot of work with scissors in preschool. Uh, not all our kids were going to be scissors users, so, you know, we made it a little bit easier with assistive technology adaptations. Um, but um, being able to, you know, look at some picture choices, maybe they were pictures ripped out of a magazine, right? And select the ones that were appropriate for what we were building a collage about, things that go, right? That's a skill. Right? And that gives us one more um, way to uh, practice that core word. We also had something in there for um, those kids that were ready for it, and it was very few. Um, but some of them were really ready for like more of a one-on-one, -on -one, some direct instruction with um, you know, some of these phonological awareness and 
you know, letter sound association. Um, so we kind of use the curriculum that um, uh, uh, Janice Light ha has done uh, with the all curriculum. We have used the procedures with that. And I wouldn't say that uh, many children have needed this level of um, support at you know this at the same time where they're learning core vocabulary, um, but the few that have have all been kids with autism, um, and um, what it did was model for the whole team how to provide appropriate you know phonics instruction where kids could make and gain real skills. Um, so we have that in there for for those for whom it's appropriate. But um, and then goodbye time the same kind of thing that you saw in the beginning with arrival time. Chants and songs with core words were a big one. Reviewing the quick questions chart and things like that. And again with you know assistive technology and voice output for the most part for these songs. I want to end by talking about sort of the family piece and, and some of the things we did to help keep the families in the loop because they are so hungry for information of how to support their kids through this language learning journey. Um, um, so partly for, for you know building their skills through information. Um, uh, every week a share packet went home that told the parents what the core words are that they were being worked on this week, um, what the book was. We tried to give them a heads up on that so that if they you know, could get to the library and borrow that book. They could do that if they wanted to. And then we always get, um, give them the word cards for whatever symbol system is appropriate for their child's AAC. So if they're, you know, um, learning to use something that has PCS or symbol sticks or something like that, they got word cards with those symbols. And, you know, they essentially went on the refrigerator and we gave them things to do with those um, throughout the week. Um, and then the other thing was suggested activities and um, strategies. So in the beginning, we really were um, assuming that most of these parents know nothing about um, AAC, and we started, you know, way before AAC with them, kind of, you know, building their understanding of the different ways of the, which their kids communicate, noticing different things, and seeing how those different things could be communicative. Because when you live with somebody, you know, it, you know, you do things automatically, and you don't realize that, um, you know, this is actually a communication exchange, and they're going to need to be the advocates for their kids and showing other people that this is how their child communicates. So, for that reason, we wanted to bring that from automatic to processed, so that they had some verbiage so that they could talk about it with other people. Um, so we introduced them to the curriculum, to the core word, idea, what the idea, whole idea of core words is. Um, why we thought those were so important, um, activities to do at home, and then you know each one had a short note from the teacher uh, talking about maybe the, some of the specific things that were either highlights from their child from before or things to, for them to watch for or to help with that were specific um, to their kids. Um, a lot of times it was for kids who were also learning signs and they were the approximation of the signs, because obviously the kids aren't doing them the way it looks in the textbook. <laughs> so building a lot of awareness of how their kids are communicating through multiple modalities. The other big thing that was important in the early time was sort of differentiating what this child can do versus what they do do. So a lot of times they'll have a, these kids will have skills that they show us every once in a great while. Right? And we wanted to be able to distinguish that from what they are doing on a regular basis and try to build more of what they can into what they habitually do. Because what we don't want to do is get into any kind of you know, debate about you know, whether a, can, a child can say a word. Right? It's, I agree with you. If you heard him say it, he can say it. I'm not going to debate that. But if he's not saying it, that's where our problem lies. <laughs> so we want to get the ones that you can do also into the pile of the words that you do say. And so uh, it helped a lot um, to relieve their anxieties, their fears that we weren't recognizing their um, you know, view of what their child could do as being valid. That was, you know, we, we were able to take that off the table by saying, you know, let's just look at increasing the frequency of what they um, can do. Um, and we also introduced the concept of modeling the AAC system. Um, and you know, built in some concepts of you know language elicitation. But um, you know, in, in the approach that we've used, we don't even get to them 
getting things back from their child until they're really comfortable using it themselves. So this is just an example of the kinds of things that might go home, you know, the words that you're learning. Um, we tried to give them ideas of how those core words can be put into sentences. That's the whole idea behind some of the words that we chose. And, um, um, you know, they, they got to be very good at modeling those with their kids and then later on eliciting them. So it really just helps them see the power of core vocabulary. When you look at, okay, I have a handful of words here, and look at all the different sentences and questions I can do. And, and um, I didn't think that people would need as much support with this. They really value having lots and lots and lots of examples. And what we found really interesting is that the teachers did too, and so did the aides. So, so we would find these things not just hung up in homes, but hung up in classrooms. Um, and so, you know, it just goes to show that people value different sorts of supports in different ways. And so um, um, all of those different examples were helpful. Then we kind of got into you know more sophisticated skills with their modeling and different activities that they could do, you know just trying to introduce also their language the concept of different language facilitation skills. Um, you know, I have um, this is j just one of them that we were sort of introducing, and it's a lot to take in from print. And I have no expectations that most parents got everything out of this that we wanted to, but we wanted to at least offer them that opportunity because sometimes this will be all they have. There's nobody to fill in the gaps. And so for those parents that, um, you know, really, you know, could handle that. And, you know, we all know there are parents that you can give a journal article to, you know. Um, and so, you know, we tried not to dumb anything down. We tried to give them as much information about strategies as we could, but also not expect that they're going to get it from from print alone. Um, this is really just you know, uh, you know, a, a drop in the bucket. They were asking for um, information about apps and how they could integrate some of the core language teaching into some apps. So we, um, uh, you know, researched for them different things that they could use to play at home. They may have some of these already. So these are either free or low cost ones. And then we gave them some ideas about, you know, how um, they could be used. Um, and then some more specific activities. And again, we kind of scripted those out. Uh, not that they have to follow the script, but that they get an idea of what we were going for um, here. And again, it was mostly about modeling that for the, for the child, not as much eliciting it. Um, and this is just an example of the kinds of you know, things that um, we'd ask teachers to reflect on and then send home to family. What kind of support or prompting was needed for their child to participate in that, um, you know, and you know, some of the things that, that, that they have achieved or some instructions that are specific to that kid. And then um, we started, you know, we didn't think about this soon enough, but we did start to get feedback from them to uh, tell us how they were using the core words at home. And so parents began to fill out forms like this so that um, we could adjust how we were doing things. Um, and, you know... Like anything else, these kids surprise you. So things we weren't seeing spontaneously in our environment with our own, all our knowledge, all our tools, all our equipment, um, all our carefully laid out ex experiences, you know, they were happening spontaneously in other environments. So, And also gave us a chance to follow up on things that were challenging for that family um, or something they had a question about. Um, and again, we just found Pictello su super helpful. Not that other apps wouldn't be equally helpful. It's you know one of the ones that um, we found the most flexible. Um, we've since started to use a couple that um, are lower cost, but nothing matches this for the eighteen or nineteen dollars that it is. Um, so it really helped families, you know, kind of stay in the loop and see where things um, were going. And. The kids loved reading these back as books, too, whether we put them online or whatever. So that's essentially the curricular approach that um, we've taken for core language instruction with these kids. Well, thanks, Carol. Gosh, I don't believe what you packed into an hour and a half. <laughs> totally amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you.